don't need a microphone, right? I can just speak from loud enough. Cool, cool. It's good to, good to be here. I do uh, quite a bit of speaking with my job. I was here actually a month ago. I think I saw most of you guys here. So uh, you never know what to expect coming into the smaller towns and stuff, but, but it's good to be here. Do a favor for me. Uh, I want you to get out. If you have a Bible or a phone where you can access Scripture, I want you to get that out. Because what I'm speaking on today, uh, I'm going to speak from a passage, share my testimony, and then uh, kind of challenge you with a couple things throughout the passage. And, and I'm a visual guy, and so I think... And if any time you can follow along with, with what uh, somebody's speaking on, it's a lot easier to internalize that. So Luke chapter 6 is where we're at. So Google it, Luke 6, or if you have a Bible app, you can type in Luke 6 and pull it up. Uh, it will be the, at the end, very end of the, of the chapter. Um, but one of my favorite passages, I think it explains or, or sheds light on my testimony quite a bit. And so I'll, I'll read the passage, share my own faith journey with you guys, may or may not relate to you, and then... I'll challenge you with a couple things at the end, and then I think we'll probably do a Q&A or something. Anybody has any questions at the end, I'd love to connect with you one-on-one -on -one afterwards. But this is Luke chapter 6. Okay? This is uh, kind of the tail end of what is known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You've probably heard about that before if you've read Scripture. Probably his most famous sermon. We have an account of it in Luke and in Matthew. And, and basically what's going on is Jesus is surrounded by this large crowd of people. Okay, it says that he's surrounded by a large crowd from all over Judea and Jerusalem that came to hear him speak and to be healed of their uh, diseases. And so he teaches on a wide variety of topics, all right, covers a lot of different things. But at the end of it, it says that the people were astonished because he had taught as one with authority. And okay, we'll come back to that here a little bit later. Get that picture in your minds. He's surrounded by a large crowd. They're kind of in awe of him and, and what he's saying. And they're listening to his words, all right? And so this is what he says at, at the very end of Luke 6. And verse 46 is where we're going to start. All right, just the last few verses. Luke 6, verse 46. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it. Because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built his house on the ground, some translations say sand, without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. We'll come back to that here in a second. My own faith journey, man, I grew up going to church, man, I believed in the existence of God. I, I considered myself to be a pretty good person compared to most people, and so my mindset as I grew up was, I believe in God, I'll go to church, I'm a good person, boom, I'm a Christian, right? Like I'm checking off all the right boxes, I'm going to, to heaven when I die. But when I look back at my, my life, middle school, high school, on into college, my life really revolved around two things. That was relationships and sports. I'm sure some young people can relate to that, relationships and sports. I had a very a large friend group, I went to a 6A high school, I was very successful, and so I was a popular kid at school, I had a girlfriend, all throughout high school, who's now my wife, we're high school sweethearts. Thankfully, we stayed together that whole time. Uh, and so my social life was in order on the, on the field. Man, I was a four-sport athlete in high school, had success on the field, and so that stuff was in order. And I had success on the football field, get a chance to earn a scholarship to play at, at K-State. So that's every kid's dream, right, growing up. I want to go D1, I want to play on TV, all that kind of stuff. And people always ask me, what was it like, right? What was it like? playing for Coach Snyder. Janine just told me she has a picture of Coach Snyder in her bathroom, right? What was it like <laughs> playing for Coach Snyder? <laughs> Don't be ashamed of that. <laughs> first, that's a first for me. <laughs> what was it like? What was it like traveling around the country playing in front of thousands and thousands of fans and on, on uh, TV? Man, it was great. It was great. I wouldn't trade for anything. I always tell kids, because I'm a coach right now, I always tell kids, if you get a chance to play college ball, go play, because it teaches you a lot. I learned a lot about, welcome, everybody's going to embarrass you to turn around and say hello. <laughs> Hi, Bailey. I learned a lot in, in college sports about, man, how to wake up at 6 a.m. and work out. We were talking about that. Russ and I were talking about that beforehand. Waking up when I didn't want to wake up to go work out. Uh, uh, getting to class on time. All these little disciplined things that have helped me as a husband and father. So all that football stuff was, was great. But when I look back at my time at K-State, what I'm most thankful for is what was happening off the field. Because it was during that time uh, I was first exposed to people my age actually following Jesus for the first time. I had a few teammates on my team that I always talk about when I share my story. Mer Morgan Burns, some of you might know that name. 
uh, Blake Slaughter, Alex Rebeck. And I always talk about Morgan Blake and Alex for the simple fact that they were different than everybody. All right? They were different. For them, it wasn't just, hey, I go to church on Sunday, I'm a Christian. But these guys were living radically different than everybody else. Right? The way they talked, the way they acted, the decisions they were making inside and outside the locker room. Like, they were even known as the, the guys on the team that would try to talk to you about Jesus. Like, I was warned my freshman year, hey, Alex is going to try to share his faith with you. Watch out. All right? Those Jesus guys. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, I'm a Christian. I got this much Jesus. I don't need that much Jesus, right? They're kind of, they're kind of weird. All right. And maybe that that might be an encouragement for somebody, somebody in here. Maybe that's what you need to hear tonight. Is if you're that Jesus guy or girl on your team, and, and and you're getting some pushback from that, don't be ashamed of that. Or if you're that Jesus man or woman in your workplace, don't be ashamed of that. Because I guarantee you, there are people like me right now surrounding you that are being challenged if you're being faithful in that witness. Because I was being challenged by Morgan Blake and Alex. Because really. When it came down to, to my faith, you could reduce it down to, to this simply. I sat on the fence. Right? Give, give me enough Jesus to get me out of hell, but not enough Jesus to actually affect how I live my life. Right? That was my mindset. Right, I'm the guy that, man, uh, on the weekends I'm going to go out and party it up, get drunk, and then wake up Sunday morning, go to church, thinking, like, that's normal, right? Everybody does that, right? So I'm going to behave a certain way around this group of friends, but, man, when I get to Bible study... I gotta watch what I say. I right? come around a different group of friends. I gotta act like a like a Christian. So I'm so thankful for Morgan, Blake, and Alex because they were so in seed and really challenging me during that time. Uh, I got done with K State. Got a chance to continue my playing career down in New Orleans, Louisiana. Signed down there in uh, 2014, and my playing career got cut short pretty soon. I had ended up having uh, four surgeries in three years, which I don't recommend. For anybody in here, and so my playing career got cut short. But that allowed me to look back at college and, and realize, hey, something needs to change. Like, what I'm saying that I believe and how I'm living is not matching up, right? And so something needs to change in, in my life. My wife and I moved back and joined a, a small group at our church, and, and God surrounded me with some very faithful people in my life. That's a consistent theme in my life, faithful people that witnessed to me. And for the first time around 2016, for the first time, the gospel really began clicking. It really began making sense. You see, I always intellectually, in my head, understood that Jesus died on the cross. Like, I would have been in your seat saying, hey, yeah, I believe that. Right? But it didn't move to my heart. It didn't change the way that I lived. You see, I, I knew of Jesus. I knew of him. I knew facts about him. Right? I could tell you about him. But I didn't truly know him. That was the first time in my life I began to realize I'm not living to earn God's grace. I'm living in response to it, right? And because of what Jesus did on the cross, his life, death, and resurrection, that should literally change everything about the way I live my life here and now. And so, man, I got baptized that fall as a sign of me going all in, saying, hey, I'm done with my old life. I'm going to start this new life with you, God. And my passions and desires began changing. I began to have a hunger for God's word, to know God on a deeper level. And I've owned a Bible my whole life, okay? It was always my good love charm. Put it on my nightstand so I don't die when I sleep, right? I'm going to take it with me on the airplane or to a wedding so this plane doesn't crash. Right? But, but nothing really ever made sense in Scripture. But the Scriptures began coming alive as I began to see that, man, I want to know this God who created me and, and died for me. Right? The, the, the sin that was in my life that I used to really enjoy doing, I no longer desire those things anymore. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Your old life is gone. Your new life is here, I've experienced that. Because the godly things that in my life that I used to look at as boring, hey, I don't want to really do those church things, but I need to do them because they're the right thing to do. Now I truly desire that. And that sin that I used to truly desire, I no longer desire those things anymore. I've become this new creation in Christ. And, and I begin to have a passion to reach other people for Jesus. And that's not normal for me. Okay? I, I'm introverted by nature. Any introverts in here? One introvert. I'm sure there's more than one introvert. There's introverts like me that wouldn't even raise your hand when you, when you get asked that question because you're afraid of people looking at you, right? I'm, I, I struggle with anxiety. I was telling the, the high school students this last month that I struggle with anxiety. And so public speaking and being in front of people is not natural for me. I'd much rather be home with my wife and kids just hanging out than in front of a group of people vulnerable like this. 
But I began to see that, man, everything in my life, my experience, my past, my platform, has allowed me a unique opportunity to point people to Jesus in a way that I wish somebody would have done earlier on in, in life. And so my, my testimony, my story is not, hey, I was a drug dealer, criminal that changed overnight. My testimony is that for the vast majority of my life, I knew of, of Jesus. And now that I know him, my life's never been the same. Right, because, because once you understand where you're going to spend eternity, like, man, I am secure in the Father's love, that he has adopted me as his child, that I have the Holy Spirit in me, that I desire to know God. Like, once you understand that security, that peace, that changes everything about the way you live your life now, right? Once the cross becomes personal to you, not just some fashion statement I wear around my neck, not just something I hear about on a Sunday or see on a movie or TV show, but man, I, I begin to realize that Jesus died for my sin. Right? Like my, my sin actually put him on the cross. Man, that changes everything about the way you live your life here and now. Right? So in this passage, man, I've, I've spent a lot of my life pursuing things and trying to build my life on the ground without a foundation. And now I know what it means to build my life on the rock. All right, now see, here's the question I want to challenge you with this evening. I'll keep coming back to it. But now, where's your foundation? What are you building your life on? Who are you building your life on? I right, see, wherever your foundation is, that'll become the source of your identity. Right? It'll determine how you live your life right now and as a result, where you will spend eternity. So what are you building your life on? What does your life revolve around? Like, what, what, is your, what is your motivations in your life? Like, if, man, if I could just take your, your heart and your desires and put them up on the screen, the thoughts you think about every day, what would that say about what you're building your life upon? You see, as Jesus, in this passage, as he's closing out this Sermon on this Mount, he, he gives us this picture, this, this visual of two different houses. We can almost picture these houses side by side, right? And from an outside perspective... They may look somewhat similar. Like, I can't really tell what kind of foundation a house has. Like, I was driving around with Bunsy. I got here a little bit early, so I was just driving around checking out the, a large town, right? <laughs> Wasting all this gas. But, but I can't really tell what kind of foundation a house has. But we know, even if you don't build houses for a living, you know that the foundation is vital to the life of that house. All right, my wife and I just went through a house buying process uh, about a month ago. And in that process, an inspector comes, right? And they're going to look at the foundation. They're going to tell you... Hey, that foundation is good or is bad? If it's bad, it's a bad investment, right? It's a bad investment. Because Jesus tells us in this, in this passage, two different houses, two different foundations, two different types of people, and he tells us what ends up exposing the foundation of each house, all right? Look at verse 48. He says this, he is like a man building a house, the one who hears and, and does his words, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, and a stream broke against that house. It could not shake it. Verse 49, but the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built his house on the ground, on the sand, without a foundation. What happened? When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. So the floods, the streams, the storms expose whether or not that house has a solid foundation. For one, what was exposed is that that house was sitting on the rock. For the other one, what was exposed is that house was sitting on the the sand. So the storms in this parable represent both a temporary this life reality and an ultimate re reality. Okay, from a temporary perspective, the storms of life represent the trials that every, every single one of us is going to face to one degree or another, right? Sickness, disease, job loss, health, uh, social discontent, all those kind of things that every single one of us will face. Sometimes people I know will face a trial and that faith or that lack of faith will be exposed. Either that person has a solid foundation I'm abiding, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing with God, or what's exposed is, hey, maybe I didn't really desire God, but maybe what I thought he could give me. All right, so, so temporary trials can certainly expose our faith, but from an ultimate perspective, the storms of life actually represent the judgment of God. That day when every single one of us will have to stand before God and give an account for our lives. Sooner or later, foundation of our life will be exposed. So the question isn't a matter of if, but when. Okay? When the trial hits now or when we stand before God and it's too, too late. So what is the foundation of your life? What are you building your life upon? Is it on Jesus or something other than, than him? 
Because here's the, here's the danger, here's the problem. As we live in this society that tells us, man, if you can just get this, this thing in your life, this it, then your life will be complete, right, and satisfied, so that's what you need to pursue. And so a lot of times it comes down to the American dream, right? That's what we're tempted with almost every day. And if you can get into that, uh, the best college you can get into, get the, the, the best degree so you can get the highest paying job, make a nice big paycheck, move up the corporate ladder, so to speak. And if you could find that right uh, lady to complete you, and then when you're financially stable, have a, nice, uh, a couple kids, and, and then live in that nice house, and drive that nice car, and save it for a nice retirement, that American dream, if you get that, your life will be complete. And so, man, that's what I want to pursue. That's what I want to build my life upon. Maybe it's not the American dream. A lot of times it comes down to what I call the three Ps. Popularity, performance, possessions. Popularity, man, if I can be well known in my school. Man, if I can go viral on TikTok, right? If a lot of people know my name, then my life will be complete. And so, man, that's what I want to build my life upon. That's what I want to pursue. Performance, right? If I can just go D1, if I play a sport, if I, can, if I can make it to Hollywood, if I can play in that band that I want to play in, if I can move up in my job, get that nice promotion, man, then my life will be complete. And so, man, that's what I want to pursue. Possessions, man, if I have a lot of stuff, if I have, have that nice wardrobe and drive that nice car that everybody wants, surely my life will be complete. And so that's what I want to Pursue, right? That's what I want to build my life upon. Popularity, performance, possessions, that's what we're tempted with daily. Now, can I, can I just tell you from somebody who's been there, who's experienced that, who's experienced it, like that'll never be enough? That'll never be enough. All right, because from my perspective, my past life, people look at my past life as the life to live. Like if, I, if I can just get what Ty had, I know my life would be fulfilled. And, and maybe not, not everybody in here is into sports, I get that, but just insert whatever your God-given talent, passion, desire is, insert that into to my story. I had Division I football, Power 5 school. Traveling around the country, playing in front of hundreds of thousands of fans, walking out of the tunnel to 50,000 yelling, screaming fans, playing on, uh, on, on national television in front of millions, on video games, seeing my name on the big screen, Right, more gear than I could fit into my closet, winning the Big 12 championship, going to all the bowl games. Like, man, if you get that, my life will be complete. It will be content, right? That's what I need to pursue in my life. Being known on campus, right? People trying to buy you lunches and free stuff, which was illegal at the time. Now it's legal. I would have had a lot of free lunches. I would have played now. That's it, right? If I can get that. My life would be complete. If that won't do it, man, going down to New Orleans, same locker room as Drew Brees and Jimmy Graham and Mark Ingram and, man, all these guys that you see on ESPN, more money in one paycheck than I have seen in my entire life. And I'm on the very low part of the total pool. I'm not making Patrick Mahomes $500 million money. I'm still being blown away by our paychecks. That's it, right? That's the life. You get that. Surely your life will be fulfilled. So, man, that's what I want to make my foundation. That's what I want to build my life upon. And honestly, looking back, I always struggle with the attention that I got at, at K-State. Because, again, I'm introverted by nature. I'm struggling with anxiety. I don't really like being known as, as Ty the football guy. I didn't really want to travel around and speak to different groups about my football experience. That just wasn't me. I always struggled. But as I look back and I reflect my time at K-State, my time at New Orleans, my playing career, as I look back and reflect, I realize that that career was never about me. It was never about me experiencing all these things for, for myself. And I realize that now, in Christ, seven, eight, nine years later, I realize that he allowed me to experience that all the people, that all the stuff that people want and desire, the popularity, the performance, possessions, all the people, all the stuff that people look at and, and really aim for in life, and he allowed me to experience that so that now in Christ, I can go around to different groups of people. I can go to old Bunsy, Kansas on a Tuesday night and tell somebody, like, that's not it. That's not it. If that's what you're pursuing in life, that'll never be enough. 
19th century uh, missionary William Carey said this, one of my favorite quotes. He said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. Oof, right? That hits you. I'm not afraid of failing. I'm afraid of succeeding at, th at thing. a bunch of things that at the end of my life are not going to matter. Or as Jesus said, you know, what's your profit to what? Gain, gain the whole world and lose your soul. I remember coming across a YouTube video of uh, Tom Brady. Uh, 60 Minutes did with Tom Brady after he won his third Super Bowl. And he's up to what, six now? Seven, retired, now he's unretired, he's coming back. Yeah. The goat of all goats, right? But <laughs> he had won his third Super Bowl and 60 Minutes did an interview with him. And you can YouTube this, but, but Tom Brady sits across from the interviewer and says something so profound to me. He says, you know, there's still something missing in my life. He says, I don't know what it is. There's still something missing in my life. Think about that. Tom Brady, three-time Super Bowl champ, MVP. Tom Brady married to a supermodel wife, Giselle. Tom Brady making more money than any of us will ever see in our lifetime, saying, yeah, there's still something missing in my life. He has it, the popularity, performance, possessions, and it's not enough. It'll never be enough, all right? I don't know who I'm speaking to specifically this evening, but what are you building your life upon? Is it on Jesus or is it on something that the world has to offer? Because those things aren't bad in and of themselves, right? I want people to like me, not dislike me. I want to I perform well. We need to excel at our jobs to the glory of God. I want to have some nice stuff. I mean, I drove a car here. I didn't walk. But to pursue those things, thinking those things can somehow bring some type of fulfillment to my life. And I'm succeeding in a lot of things that don't matter. I'm gaining the world and losing my soul. All right, we have an overview. That's the question I want to challenge you with. Hopefully it'll stick with you. What are you building your life upon? Let's look specifically now, okay, at the difference between these two types of people, these two houses, right? Because if you're sitting there in your seat thinking, okay, I hear you, Ty, like, okay, I want to build my life on the rock. Now tell me, what, the, what does that look like? All right, Jesus tells us what that looks like. All right, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and what and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who hears my words and does them is the one on the rock. Everyone who hears my words and does not do them is the one on the sand, right? The difference between these two types of people is obedience. It's those who live their lives in obedience to Jesus versus those who do not. It's those who maybe have some empty profession of faith like I used to have. Versus those who live with a true heart that's surrendered to him. Again, thinking about this context here, this famous Sermon on the Mount, Scripture says he's surrounded by a large group of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem. People who have heard about Jesus. People who have seen his miracles, probably saw his baptism. Saw him multiply the loaves and the fish, right? All that. People who have seen what he's done, has heard about him. And they even acknowledged him as a teacher of authority. And Jesus says acknowledging him as someone special is not enough. Right? Respecting some of his teachings is not enough. Many of them even called him Lord. Like me back in college. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Acknowledging him. Some intellectual knowledge, but their lives didn't follow that pursuit. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I tell you. What does Lord mean? When scripture says that Jesus is Lord, that's not another name for him. Okay, that's, that's actually a title. And my name is Ty. Husband and father are not my name. Janine didn't is introduce me as husband, father, right? Those are, those are titles, and they mean something in my relationship to my wife and to my kids. So what does Lord mean when it says that he is Lord? It simply means that he is master and owner, right? That he is in the position of a rightful ruler of my life. See, here's what we need to understand about Scripture. If you haven't been paying attention up to this point, like lock in now, okay? Here's what we need to understand that Scripture makes clear, okay? That all of us have been created in God's image. That you have been created in God's image. You are an image bearer of God. The fact that you have a capacity to love and fight for justice and, 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 and desire mercy speaks to the fact that you've been created in God's image. Now, because you've been created by God, because I've been created by God, our lives are accountable to Him. And there's coming a day when all of us will stand before God and give an account for our lives. And we just talked about it a little bit ago. Now, here's the problem. 
most people think that's not that big of a deal. Like, yeah, I've made a few mistakes in my life, but that's not big, that big of a deal. I'm probably on the good side of creation. Like, of all the people that have ever existed, I'm probably on the good half. Like, God will understand, right? He'll grade on the curve like my teachers do. But what Scripture makes clear is that sin is not something outside of me, as if I just made a few mistakes. Sin is actually a condition of my heart. It uses, the Bible uses this language. It says, you are dead in your sin. Right? So, so now listen, if, if, if I'm dead in my sin and I have to face God on, on judgment day, my only hope is that God would do something for me, right? That he would do something on my behalf. The solution to my sin can't come from something that I offer to God, right? Here, God, let me make up for my sin by being a good person. Here, God, take my church membership. Here, here God, my good will outweigh my bad. The solution to my sin can't come from something that I offer to God. It must be that something that he does on my behalf, something that he offers to me. Right? Look back in, in history. Think back in history for a second. When I say history, I'm saying way back to the beginning of time. Right? Genesis 1, God creates man in his image. Genesis 3, what happens? Adam and Eve rebel against God. Right? And they're, they're naked and they're ashamed. They're guilty before God. Now something happens. In Genesis 3, a lot of people skip over it. It's easy, easy to miss. It's easy little detail to miss. Adam and Eve are guilty before God. They're ashamed. Verse 21 in Genesis 3, it says, The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. In other words, an animal had to be killed. Blood had to be shed for them to be covered, for their nakedness to be covered. Right? God did something for them on their he had. That pattern continues throughout the whole Old Testament, right? Israelites are captive in, in Egypt, and God raises up a prophet, Moses, to go s take the Israelites out of captivity and lead them into the promised land, right? And he tells Pharaoh, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh won't do it, so God sends, what, ten different plagues upon the land of Egypt. The last plague is the plague of death. Death would sweep over the land that very night, kill the firstborn of every household. And if you're familiar with that passage, God tells the Israelites, this very night, if you sacrifice a lamb, an unblemished, spotless lamb, and what? Smear some of the blood over the doorpost of your home. This very night, death will pass over you. You will be protected. That's exactly what happened. That's why the Jews to this day celebrate the Passover celebration. Again, God did something for them on their behalf to protect them, to shield them from death. Now, is all of that just some cool... Bible stories that we hear about in Sunday school? No. That's a real history. And all of that is foreshadowing the day when Jesus steps on the scene. Because in John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus walking towards him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What he's saying is the crucified Messiah, this is the risen Lord who's going to cover our sin, who's going to protect us from death. Romans 6.23, the gospel in one verse, the wages of sin is death. What you earn for your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in what? In my moral life? In my goodness? No. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. See, Jesus took your sin, my sin upon himself at the cross. All of my guilt, all of my shame, my sinful thoughts, motives, desires was placed upon Jesus at the cross. He became sin for you took your sin, my sin upon himself, took the punishment that we deserve, died in death, and we deserve, rose again from the grave three days later. Right? Another way to understand that is the Father treated the Son like us so that he could treat us like the Son. Right? The Father treated the sinless, perfect Son as if he was a sinner so that he could turn and treat us guilty sinners as if we had lived the perfect life of Jesus. Right? Jesus was covered and your sin so that you could be covered in his righteousness. Again, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. He died as your substitute. Now, in response to that, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Turn and trust in me. Trust in my life, death, and resurrection. Not acknowledge me one, one day out of the week. And follow me as the Lord who has gone to the cross for you. 
Recognizing that, man, he is the one who has created me, the one who has redeemed me, the one who has purchased me with his own blood. And therefore, man, I want to live my life for him. Now, that may sound simple, and that's because it is. Turn and trust in Jesus who died in my place. So simple a child can understand. I got a six-year-old daughter, three-and-a-half-year-old son. They can understand. But think about how distorted the words follow me are in our, in our society. Right? We live in a social media culture, right? How many of you have social media? Almost everyone in here, I'm guessing. All right, there's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat. I mean, I grew up with uh, dial-up internet, right? You had to dial up to use internet. <laughs> you got the high-speed stuff as a lucky one, right? But, but think about our social media culture. I'm not speaking on the evils of social media tonight. It's not what I'm doing. Right? It's a good way to connect with people. But think about our context that we're, what we're living in right now. When you say, follow me, you can do what? Go online, click the follow button, and follow somebody without actually being in a relationship with them. I mean, I can follow people halfway across the world and not even know them. But I, could, I could go online right now, tonight when I get home. Go on Instagram. I don't have Instagram, but if I did, I'd go on Instagram. Click follow on LeBron James. All right? Greatest basketball player alive. And I can stay up to date with what he posts about basketball and his family and all that kind of stuff. Now, imagine if I get some confidence. So they say, you know what? I'm going to fly out to Los Angeles. And I wouldn't do that right now. Because nobody wants to go to California right now. It's a mess. <laughs> but hypothetically, I book a flight out to Los Angeles, and somehow I find LeBron's address, and I take an Uber to LeBron's house. And I go up to that door. Hey, LeBron. It's me. What's happening, right? I'm, I'm getting ter get carried away in handcuffs. But LeBron, I follow you. He's going to say, man, I don't know you. I don't know you, right? Because I can follow him intellectually without being in relationship with him. I can follow him intellectually and, and not follow him relationally. I can be in the crowd, seeing the miracles of Jesus, listening to him, to his teaching, even telling my friends, hey, hey guys, I heard Jesus speak today. I was up on that mountainside. He gave a great sermon. And I can acknowledge him. And I, could, I could attend a, a church service. I could go to a, a youth group. And I can know of him without truly knowing him. Has the cross truly changed my life, right? The reality is that Jesus is Lord. That's not up for debate. He is Lord. So, man, I either bow to him as Lord and Savior or I bow to him as Lord and Judge when it's too late. The call of Jesus is, is a command to follow him as Lord of my life. I'm submitting myself to him in response to him submitting himself to death on my behalf. Again, as I mentioned with my own story, I'm not living to earn God's grace, as if God's grace could ever be earned in the first place. I'm living in response to it, in response to what he's done at the cross, right? What is your foundation? What is your foundation this evening, all right? You can know of Jesus again like I, like I did without truly knowing him. You can check off that box that says Christian on that questionnaire. You can post a Bible verse on your social media and have your heart far from him. The rock solid foundation. The thing that carries us through the storms of this life and protects us from the judgment of God. Is whether or not it's truly responded to Jesus. To follow him as Lord of my life. Uh, I'm going to close with a Christian hymn. I'm not actually going to sing it because I can't sing. But one of my favorite hymns is called My Hope is Built. And I believe it's based off of this passage. But, but think about these words in relation to what we just read. Okay? It says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I challenge you to build your life on, on Jesus, if you haven't already. Thanks for letting me share my story. Um, we can open it up for questions if we want to. I would love to connect with you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I love speaking to big groups, but, man, what I live for is connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. So I'd love to hear your story and uh, answer any questions you might, might have. But any, any questions uh, up front now, football-wise, life-wise, faith-wise?
Hopefully somebody has something, so I'm not standing up here awkwardly, because again, I'm an introvert. Um, my face is about to turn really red right now. Do you have a dog? Do I have a dog? I do. Lucy is her name. And uh, we're going through a weird stage, because she is, got her in, my, my wife got her in college 2011, so that makes her 11 years old. So she's getting towards the end, but my daughter, that's all she's known. And so she, she told me the other day, she's like, yeah, when I get married, Lucy's going to be my dog. And I'm like, Dave, I don't think she's going to last that long. What kind so, of dog? She's a Maltese. Yep. She's a Maltese. She's, she's funny dog. Right. When you came to know Christ, did you have the support of your family, or did they just did they question it, or did they wonder, or did they fully understand? Uh, yes, great question. Um, yes and no. Some some were supportive, some really weren't. Um, there's a context to that. Um, but I really didn't know what it meant to count the cost to follow in Jesus until I started following Jesus. And I realized that there's some family relationships that are strained. And there's some friendships, people that don't really want to hang out with me anymore. Uh, I was talking to, I think it was Bailey, right, uh, about this um, when I came the first time. But um, talking about how when I'm saying yes to Jesus, there's things I need to say no, no to. And uh, so, yeah, part, part of that process for me was recognizing that my hope is that those family members and friends are looking at me the, the way that I looked at Morgan Blake and Alex in college. Like, why is he taking this so seriously? Because if that is the case, then I know they're being challenged. So, yeah, there's yes and no. How would you say you went from being on the fence to having a meaningful relationship with Christ? Uh, only by God's grace. I mean, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 uh, that God who shined light and out of the darkness shined, our, shined his light in our hearts to give us the knowledge of, of Jesus. And so you reference Genesis 1 when God said, let there be light. Like that same miracle of physical creation is what he does in our hearts when we turn to Christ. And so it was those guys in college that were sowing seed into my life. Um, guys in New Orleans that were watering that seed. And then when I got plugged in that small group, um, started reading through scripture, applying it to my life. And uh, yeah, really it was just challenging uh, it was it was other people in my life that were challenging me by their witness and by what they were saying to where finally um, I actually responded in a it was a baptism service and went up and I felt like okay this is it like either I'm, I'm all out or I'm all in so how um, big a part was reading the Bible reading scripture oh huge I mean what I'm thankful for is like when I was in college I, I a couple of those teammates started a Bible study and so I started going to this Bible study we started memorizing scripture and uh, again, at the time, I'm not a Christian, but like God was leading me to do habits like read scripture and memorize scripture that now have been so instrumental in my, in my faith, faith walk and my maturity and growth. Um, so, yeah, I think all of those things um, led me to the point where I'm now. And that helps me when I'm trying to like reach other people. I'm really trying to connect people with God's word because it says his word doesn't come back void. When somebody connects with God's word and begins reading it, it's either going to harden their heart or soften their heart. There's only two options, so that's what it did for me, soften my heart. And sorry, one more question. Go for it. So, as you were reading it, if you ever do, a lot of it doesn't naturally make sense. So how did you make it meaningful, or how did you come to a place where you understood? Yeah, I, I think, I would say most of what you read in Scripture uh, is not super complicated. For me, understanding that the whole thing from Genesis to Revelation is pointing to what Jesus did on the cross. Like, yes, Gen uh, uh, Old Testament is real history, but there's so many foreshadows to what Jesus is going to do in the New Testament. Jesus is here talking about his life, first-hand witness, and then the rest of the New Testament, hey, Jesus is coming back. This is how you should live in light of his return. Um, I would say the, the reason I didn't understand it, I think, back then, is that I didn't have the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus says in John 14, 15, 16, 17, that I'm, sending, I'm leaving, and I'm sending the Holy Spirit who's going to be your teacher and comforter. And so if somebody has the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to be taught God's Word, um, which is hard. Because someone, someone without the Spirit doesn't understand that they don't have the Spirit, like I did. Right? But uh, that, that's, that's the basic thing, is, is having the Spirit. And then, uh, uh, I mean, I was taught just a simple method of looking at the context of a passage. and Who's the author? Who are they writing to? That helps me understand, like, how can I apply this to my life? So, sorry for the long answer. Sorry for all the questions. No. <laughs>
question. If you wouldn't mind, talk a little bit about your FCA and how you, how I'm, I'm imagining in my brain it was kind of a, a God's knock on the head when you came and said, oh my gosh, there's this opening. Because sometimes those just, you just kind of fall into a perfect yeah. scenario. Yeah, so I was teaching and coaching, and uh, God was doing the change in my heart. I began to have more passion talking to my players about Jesus, less of a passion for putting together lesson plans and stuff. And so I was thinking, at the time, I'm more mature in my faith, obviously, now. At the time, I thought, if I'm not in ministry, I can't do anything worthwhile for God, which is not the case. Like, now I understand you can be a full-time minister regardless of what you're doing. I'm a stay-at-home parent. I'm a secretary. Whatever I'm doing, I'm a pastor. Um, but so that got me, you know, thinking, how do I get into ministry? What does that look like? I got connected with Morgan. He knew my boss. Um, in Wichita, she's out of Wichita, she does the whole state of Kansas. And so I sat down with her over two months, that was in 2018. My wife, we had our daughter, we were pregnant with our, she was pregnant with our son, and uh, we, we were like, yeah, God's calling us into this. So I left a full-time paid position to go raise support for ministry while my wife's pregnant. People, some people thought we were crazy. Um, but went full-time that fall after support raising, and then, yeah, been on staff for three years. Um, FCA, uh, I do the North Central Kansas region, it's like 15 counties, but Wabunzi is part of this. Um, but we do huddles at school, Wabunzi has a huddle, we do a lot of events, so a lot of camps throughout the year. You guys have to come to our state camp next year. Uh, we do some summer camps, and then we do some one-on-one -on -one discipleship as well. And kind of what we prioritize is reaching coaches. Uh, anybody that's played sports in here, you could probably remember most of your coaches that you played for, good or bad. And so what we realize is, man, if, if a coach, if a light bulb comes on for a coach, like that's going to change generations. Um, so we try to try to really empower a coach to use that platform to start a huddle, to do a camp, and really try to reach their kids. So, um, yeah, I've been st on staff now three and a half years, coming up on four years. Yep. What was your career before FCA? Teaching and coaching. High school? High school, yeah. I, well, I taught a year at Fort Island Middle and then a couple years at that at that Junction City High School. My dad's a teacher and a coach there, so... Natural fit for me. At Junction. At Junction. Yeah. Do you live at Junction? I live in Junction, yes. Yes, I do. No football questions? <laughs> well, my grandson said if he wouldn't have got hurt in 2012, they would have won all the way. Ah, maybe. <laughs> Bunch of what is. Said. Yeah, I broke, it's kind of eerie, so I broke, I never had problems with injuries. My junior year, 10th game of the season, TCU, I break my left ankle, and then we lose to Baylor the next week. I was out, and Tyler Locker was out that game. And then my senior year, 10th game of the season, at TCU, I broke my other ankle. Same opponent, same team, same type of tackle, different ways. And so I missed the last two games, came back for the bowl games both years. And then I also tore both leg rooms. So football's a violent sport. <laughs> I was always told NFL stands for not for long, which is very true. <laughs> <laughs> very true. That's good. Somebody That's have a question over there? Somebody was raising their hand. Oh, no, I was telling her to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but did you do uh, baseball or track in the spring? I did uh, baseball and track. Uh, Flip-flop years. Two years of track, two years of baseball. And I played basketball in the winter. I was telling a group of people, uh, a couple weeks ago, I tried wrestling one time. It's a true story. I was, uh, I think I was in like, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade. My dad takes me to a wrestling practice. Hey, son, you're gonna try wrestling. So, okay. And I was wrestling this kid, and at one point I kind of stepped back, and the kid had peed on himself a little bit. And I said, Dad, I'm out. <laughs> I am retired. I'm gonna go dribble the basketball. So I have a lot of respect for wrestlers. I've been wrestling here. I, I, I enjoy watching it. It takes a lot of toughness. It's a grit. It was just, it was just too much for me. So, I had basketball and then track and baseball in the spring. What event did, did, or events did you do? In track? Oh man, way back. Um, senior year I did 4x1, 200, javelin, and long jump. So, a bunch of different stuff. Do you do track? What events? Uh, two mile, one mile, 800, and 4 Okay, so here's the question. Two mile, one mile, is that long distance or mid distance? Long distance. Okay, thank you. My wife, so my wife coaches cross country. She runs. She runs like, I was telling them, she runs like 10K. She ran the Boston Marathon. She ran, runs 10Ks, 5Ks. 
And uh, she always says, that's mid-distance. I'm like, no, that is long distance. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, the long distance is cross country. It's mid-distance. Two miles is not mid-distance. Do you have siblings? Uh, yes. Older sister, Rindy, who lives in Lindsburg. And then younger sister um, lives in Texas. And then younger brother lives in Junction. So that's good help. So for some reason, I have to ask, well, how is Bill Schneider really like? Uh, well, as you, a want coach the you want the TV interview answer, or do you want the real? I want the real. That's why I want the real. <laughs> because you hear about him writing uh, you know, level, notes and stuff, you know. And yeah. Um, at that level, you don't get a lot of interaction with your head coach. I mean, I, I don't know about other programs. Uh, he is phenomenal at managing, like the, the management aspect, mm -hmm. getting the right coaches in the right places. Uh, our itinerary, like our travel itinerary was to the minute, like 531 we're here, 428 we're here. Um, and we always joke, I actually saw a former teammate of mine today and he had showed up late to lunch. I was like, bro, you're not on cat time anymore? Like cat time was a thing. So like if you're five minutes early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Um, and that stuck with me. Like there's times when I, I like wake up, like did I just oversleep or something? Like and it still sticks with me. Um, so he's great at, at management. I just had way more interaction with my position coach. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, the writing letters to people and um, the class that he operated his program with, the discipline, like we were talking about that um, today with a, a buddy of mine, um, that that's something missing from a lot of programs nowadays is the, just the self-discipline. Um, we've almost gone the other way of you can't do two days anymore, you can't do full padded practices. Um, and really what that does, I mean, you hate it when you're going through it, but it sets you up for real life, really. I mean, you go to a job every day, you don't like stuff, you just think I do it. How old were you when you got married? How old? Um, 2014, so uh, I was, what, 26? I'm 31. Let me do the math for me real quick. <laughs> uh, July 5th of 2014 is when we got married. So it was right after I got out of college. So I think I was 23, 23 or 24. So we had been together since um, I was a sophomore, she was a freshman, 2006. So coming up on 16 years. Wow. So yeah. And we both kind of came to Christ around the same time, which is really, really cool. When you watch the K State game now, what runs through your mind? Is it something you kind of still miss, or is it something you say, well, I'm glad that's over, I'm glad where I'm at, where I'm doing Oh, I miss it. I'd go back and do it again if I could. Save the injury, I mean, save the, the surgeries. I don't like, I don't like going to games, honestly. Like, after, like, being on the field, I, I go into the stands and people are just yelling, oh, you should have done this, or yeah. some of those. Not everybody, there's great fans, but there's some people that, it's like, you have no idea what they're even going through out there. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't like showing up two hours early, drive, or walking two miles to get into the game. Um, so I don't go to many. I watched, actually, the last couple of years I've watched quite a bit because there was a kid from Junction that I was kind of discipling and mentoring. Um, Ryan Hennington, I don't know if you know that name, but he played uh, linebacker. Um, so at least I knew somebody on the field. Uh, but I just, I don't watch it a ton anymore. It, it, college football has changed, college sports in general has changed so much with the NIL stuff and the transfer portal. Uh, I think NCAA, as we know it, I don't know if it's on record, but I think it's going to be gone pretty soon. Was, was Tyler Lockett playing at the same time you were? Yeah, he's a year younger. That's my dad's favorite player. He always talks about Tyler Lockett. Yeah. Kind of it's impossible to practice against him every day and not get better. So yeah. he was, he was <laughs> phenomenal. He loves him. Yeah, he's a good, he's a good, he's a good guy. Yeah. I got a deep question for you. I love deep questions. <laughs> okay. If you're, well, I guess in Mike's situation, I got a couple kids that have some significant women in their life that are very unfamiliar with church, God, Jesus, any of that. Yeah. How do you, I guess, approach that? What would you recommend approaching that from me from like a removed perspective, but still, you know, around them a lot? Yeah. I don't want to chase them away, but I don't want to smother them. It's, uh, would you have any guidance for someone like that? Uh, and what specifically? You're just the women in their life is not good or? Oh, they're wonderful girls. Oh, okay. Wonderful. So, and I'd love them, you know, to seal the deal someday. But I, they're, you know, my boys grew up going to church and I want them to stay. But my fear is if they hook up with the individual that isn't, 
used to going to church or even knowledgeable of the church, they might be pulled away. So I want to embrace them and bring them in without scaring them or smothering them. I'm not sure what a good route would be to, for introduction. Um, that's tough. Uh, the way I learned to share the gospel was a guy named Ray Comfort. If you go on YouTube and type in Living Waters, on Ray, uh, Ray Comfort or Living Waters, um, that to me is the, the, the most, uh, the simplest, pardon my English, simplest, uh, most uh, conversational way of evangelizing somebody. And so um, that would be my recommendation. Check out some of his videos, see if it's something you can adapt in your conversation and maybe even send some to your I mean, my wife has done this before, just send some to her sisters and check them out. Uh, at the end of the day, what I believe from Scripture and how I approach other people is uh, it's impossible to truly encounter Jesus and remain the same. And so I need to expose that person to Jesus and his word. And as hard as this is, there's some people that um, are hardened to it. And sometimes it's not the right time. But... but it's impossible for somebody to truly encounter him and, and remain the same. So uh, I've talked about this to, to coaches before and different things like that. Like you look at like people always say, oh, like youth is getting so bad or the behavior is bad. Um, the solution is not behavior modification, right? It's not uh, I got to clean up their life or their behaviors, though that's discipline is good. The solution is I need to expose them to Jesus. Right? And he's the one that changes their hearts and I can walk alongside them. And so the fundamental issue that I always have anybody, somebody struggling with marriage or um, any other sin in their life, whatever that is, it's not first addressing that sin or that issue. It's first, hey, you know Jesus? Like, where are you going when you die? Like, what are you placing your faith and trust in? And I think if somebody, obviously, if they wake up to that, then the Spirit's moving in them. And I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I approach uh, the Ray Comfort Living Waters on YouTube. That's some phenomenal stuff. Okay. Appreciate it. Yep. What is one memory that will always stick to you on the football field? On the football field? <clears throat> uh, I have a few. Um, Texas, my freshman year. Um, so I, I ended up starting, I played quarterback in high school and then um, when I got to spring ball, they switched me over to safety, so I never played safety before. And somebody got injured in front of me, um, like the first game of the season, so I was like starting as a freshman playing Texas. Like I grew up like a Colt McCoy, Vince Young fan, and uh, and so seeing them, like we played a really good game. I played a really good game, so that was really cool. Like welcome to Big 12 moment. Um, my junior year, going down to Oklahoma in 2012, beating them. Um, they were ranked like sixth, I think we were 10th or 11th, and that kind of put us on the map. And then, uh, say the other one is the Big 12 championship that year. Uh, I was injured. I broke my leg, so I was on the sideline. But there was a point during the game where it was the old press box, but Willie was up on top of the press box, and they were playing jump around. And he was up there jumping, and the fans were just going nuts. And so that was really cool. Was I it snowing? On one leg. <laughs> was it snowing? <laughs> was it snowing? Yeah. Because there was one um, game when he was up there, snowing. and it was, I can't remember which game that was. It was a yeah. huge game, and it was snowing, and he was up there. Yeah. So they, that thing came down uh, right after. My junior year, and then they built, built a new one, and now they have the nice complex and everything. Like, you guys, man, as soon as I leave, <laughs> all the nice stuff. How many surgeries have you had? Uh, four. Four. Yeah. You have you? Not fun. <laughs> have you had surgery? Shoulders were the hardest. Stay humble with all of like the fame and like the glory in a sense, like all of the everybody, like oh, there's Ty Zimmerman. Yeah, I just think now, uh, now that I'm in Christ, I have the right perspective. Before, like, and I still struggle with pride. Like, don't I don't want to put on this front like a this super humble guy. Like, I still struggle with it. Um, but the more I get exposed to God's word, the more the Spirit's humbling me, and I recognize that I'm just a sinner saved by grace and. Um, but but the but yeah, having that perspective now that see when I was playing, I would turn down all kinds of speaking opportunities and hated hated doing interviews and being known as like the football guy, like I said. Um, but now I realize that that platform allows me to go into a school and people can play a highlight film and most most people will listen. Um, and so I recognize. I mean, like Jesus says, to much who is given. 
much is required. And so I realized, like that's a humbling thing for me to realize that that whole platform that I have is never about me. Like I need to use that to point other people to Jesus. So it's easier for me now to embrace the Tyler football guy because now I can be like, yeah, that was my life, and now this is this is my life. So she so played some highlights earlier. I did. Oh, yeah, she missed them. Missed. I can play like for five, it. six times. <laughs> and it on. was on repeat. He repeat. <laughs> I'll play it again for you. <laughs> Highlights always make it look better than the actual work. That's what I tell people. All right, any other questions? Oh, sorry, could you? Does your children get upset when you have to, like, come to places? Oh, yeah, they don't understand. They're like, oh, Daddy, where are you going? Yeah. Um, I'll get home. What is it, 7.30? I'll get home by 8.30, so they'll still be up. My son will probably be running around. Causing havoc, so uh, yeah, but, but that's fun too because I get to tell them, Hey, I'm, I'm going to talk to people today about Jesus, mm -hmm. so it just cultivates some conversations with them. My son, I, I mean, three and a half, I don't think he can comprehend a whole lot. My daughter is starting to ask people questions, and we talk through scripture and try to help them memorize scripture. And, and my, my wife stays at home, um, she coaches and does photography, but she stays at home, homeschools our daughter, um, and so she's made a tremendous sacrifice to. Disciple our kids, which is the most important. So, yeah, but they, they don't understand fully, I believe. Is your speaking circuit going to take you maybe down to Wichita to all the high schools there? Uh, it's, I, I've been to a bunch of different places. I mean, in my area and outside my area. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, What's yeah the it's been the most humbling thing. We talk about humility. Like, I, I kid you not, I've been terrified of public speaking my whole life. Like, I'd be in cold, I remember giving speeches in high school, I'd be drenched in sweat. Like, I remember walking back to my desk and my classmate was like, do you need this, this towel? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I never would have imagined doing anything like that, but once I took this job, people started calling for whatever reason and uh, asking to come speak. And I remember the first time I spoke, somebody was like, hey, can you speak to this group of youth? For 20 minutes, and I was like, 20 minutes? I can't speak for 20 minutes. What am I going to say for 20 minutes? Uh, and now it feels like it goes by like that. So it's just, it's just cool how when I'm speaking, I feel the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. and so it's when I feel the, the presence of the Holy Spirit the most. And Biggest crowd you ever spoke to? How many? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. I spoke at Oasis a couple years ago, and that was a few hundred. Um, so nothing, nothing crazy. I used to be focused on all the numbers. They used to deter me sometimes when I show up and not a lot of people were there, but now I'm realizing that somebody's in the crowd that needs to get the message. So. I like that shirt, Binge Jesus. Oh, thank chosen. you. Yep. I'm waiting for uh, season three. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I am losing my patience. <laughs> I keep, like, Hurry up, Dallas. I know. I'm call, like, I follow, subscribe on YouTube or whatever, and they're like, had a setback, had a snowstorm. I'm like, you're filming in Utah and Texas. Like, yeah, let's get going here. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, let's give him a huge round of applause. <laughs> Be over here just if you want to talk or exchange information we can